In this video, we're going to take a simple overview look at lambdas in Kotlin, and we're going to look at them from the perspective of me, a Java programmer. So if you're a Java programmer trying to get your, your head around what a lambda is, I hope this is helpful to you. They're important in Kotlin because Kotlin can be a functional programming language where we're dealing a lot with functions and sometimes we're sending functions to go find the work to do. And that's where lambdas are very helpful. So let's start with what we know about a Java-based method. We'll typically have an access modifier, a return type, a method name, and then in parentheses, we will have any parameters that are passed into the method. Here's a parameter variable named factor of type int. Now we have open curly and close curly, and that's where the work of the method happens. So we're saying return the factor is plus factor. In Java, it's going to take this as a string, it's going to treat the plus as a concatenation operator, and then concatenate the factor on the end and return that, that would be a string. So let's consider how we would take this Java method and think about it as a Kotlin function. First, we'll take that public modifier off. Public is assumed in Kotlin, but one footnote, it has a little different definition than you might be used to in Java. Kotlin's definition of public is any client who can see the declaring class sees its public members. So if your class is exposed to the outside world, the public members will be as well. A nice alternative is internal, which is similar to public, but any client inside this module who sees, sees the declaring class will see the internal members. Either way, I went ahead and dropped the access modifier off, so we'll just assume it's public. Now we also have the word fun, which means function. So in Kotlin, that's how we declare a function, function similar to what we would call a method in Java. So at this point, we've dropped the access modifier public, we're assuming public, and we've declared this as a function. But there's more work to be done. First, let's move the curly out a little bit to give ourselves a little bit of room. And if you didn't see that, let me repeat that again. Let's take the return type and let's put the return type after the parameter variables in the parentheses. And also let's go ahead and add a colon. So in Kotlin functions, the return type doesn't come before the method name. It actually comes between the parameter list and the open curly. And there's also a colon that separates it from the parameter list. So we'll do a similar thing to our parameter variables as well. We're gonna move the parameter name to the left and we're going to move the type to the right and then we're going to separate those with a colon. So at this point, we've converted a Java method to a Kotlin function. See, very similar, just a few substituted words, a few new symbols, and move a couple things around. And cleaning it up a little bit, we get to this point. So just take a moment, make sure you're comfortable with wh what this looks like. One other subtle change that you might notice is in Kotlin, we capitalize the I in int where we don't in Java. So on this cleaned up version, I've capitalized that I. Now a lambda is really like a function that can be assigned to a variable and passed around. And as I said, it can go find the work it needs to do. So by passed around, I mean it could be passed to another function, for instance. So uh, when we think of a lambda, just think about a function, but let's reorder things a little bit. Think about a function that has a bit less syntax, if that's helpful. So what do we need to do to change this function into a lambda? Well, first of all, let's give ourselves a little bit of room. Let's take the work that we're going to do and let's move it to the right a little bit. And actually that return is optional in a lambda. The last line executed is what's considered the return. So we could chop that off. We'll leave it there for now. Let's take the parameter variables, or in other words, the things that are passed in, and let's put them on the same line. We'll keep this colon where it is. So you notice we have what's coming in on the left and what's happening on the right. In other words, in on the left, out on the right. Now let's add a dash and a greater than symbol, in other words, an arrow to separate those two things. So parameter on the left, what we're doing on the right. Now let's take the curlies and rearrange them a little bit and kind of put a nice little, uh, a nice little container around this lambda that we've just made. Now we can drop that fun because we no longer have uh, a function. We've, we've essentially made a one line lambda. Let's change it to var. So in other words, we're going to make a variable that's going to hold this lambda. We can clean up the, a little bit of syntax we don't need anymore. And let's go ahead and add an equal sign for assignment. 
And now what we have is we have our lambda here, which is essentially this self-contained function. We are assigning it to a variable called method name in this case. You could change that if you want. And it's of type string, although oftentimes that type will be uh, input and then arrow and then output. So I'll clean that up on our next slide as well. And here we go. So tightening it all up together, you see this is what our lambda looks like in its full form. Variable method name declares the variable of type int going into string equals the input int here is the variable factor and the output is what happens to the right of the arrow and you notice that we can refer to that variable coming in on the right side just like so. Now because we've set this up and we've assigned it to a variable we could actually pass that variable into another function and that would represent passing this entire lambda into that function and that's completely doable. Another thing that you'll see frequently and maybe even more often is just constructing the entire lambda right here in this method call. The syntax can be a little bit confusing unless you've seen this whole chain of events that got us to this point right now. But the good news is we don't have to put this entire unit within this open paren and close paren. A lot of this is optional. As a matter of fact, in a lambda, the only thing that's really required is this behavior right here. These other parts are optional and let's see when we can remove them. So first of all, the type. Well, the type can be inferred. The Kotlin compiler can figure that out many times. So unless we really have to specify it, let's go ahead and take that away. Also, remember if we're writing the lambda inside of a method call, then it's kind of considered inline or anonymous. And in that case, we don't need to store it in a variable at all. Now, if we're passing one parameter in, then we can eliminate the parameter because Kotlin does a special thing for us. If there's only one parameter, it will create a variable called it, and it will pass that parameter into the variable called it, and then we can simply refer to that variable called it inside of our lambda. So that gets rid of all of that, and all of a sudden, look at how small our lambda is. We take all this, we collapse it, and we drop it right here, right inside of our evaluate statement. Now, this is something that we'll see several times in Kotlin, but if you're not used to that syntax and how we got to this point, and the fact that we've removed a lot of optional things, you can say, what in the world is going on here? Especially, uh, in this case, typically, we would no longer have the word factor. That would be the word it, the variable it, and then you'd be looking up and down for this variable it, and you might not be able to find it. So, as I often do, I record videos in reverse order, so the first one you watch is the last one I recorded so that I can go forward and show you some things that we're gonna do in some future videos. This is a video where we are going to wire up some live data to an autocomplete text. And what we have here is kind of a, a funny lambda going on where we have, we're observing some live data. In other words, we're looking at data to change. And when that data changes, it's going to come into this open and closed curly here. Now what you see here in this lambda is you have an input parameter here called plants. And that's essentially this guy unwrapped a little bit. It's just a collection of plants. And then you have the separation of input to output. On the output side, you see we are using that variable that was passed in, and we're essentially associating it to an autocomplete text. That one's a lot of typing here, but it is one line, so it's fairly easy to see. And one thing to note is that this will get invoked any time the data inside of this live data object changes. More on that to come in our lectures that are coming though. Now, this one is particularly confusing, which is why I wanna call it out. This is part of a unit test that we're going to write. And what we have here again is another, uh, kind of like a lambda thing going on here. And you see that we are asserting not null it, assert true it. What we're doing is we're looking at this live data collection here, plants, and inside of that we have an array list of plants. So it re refers to that array list of plants. We're asserting it's not null, and I'm sorry, we got here to this observe forever because we're looking at that. We're looking at that collection of plants. So when we look at it, when we see it change, we assert it's not null, and then we also assert that it has a size of greater than zero. So in other words, there's something inside of it. Now, what makes this interesting is remember up to this point that IT represents an array list of plants or a collection of plants. We have a little shortcut operator in Kotlin for any kind of collection, or I should say several kinds of collections, where we can just say collection then dot for each, 
And then we get a quick and dirty for each loop. And I shouldn't even say quick and dirty, we'll just say a quick for each loop. So this is an iteration over all of the elements inside of this collection. But guess what? This also acts like a lambda. Uh, and this is where it gets a little bit tricky because within the boundaries of this open and close curly, uh, the definition of IT changes. Now we're looking at an iteration variable. In other words, we're looking at the variable that represents every plant that we're shaking hands with when we do this for each loop. So here again, it's a little bit tricky because that IT definition changes because we kind of have like a nested thing going on. Uh, and also, if you're not used to what IT is, you'll look all up and down for a declaration of IT and you won't find it. So that's a look at lambdas in Kotlin. There's actually quite a bit more about lambdas, but this is a good starter or a good memory refresher. I hope this has been helpful and I look forward to reading your comments. Thank you.